Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing BurgerFi stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. BurgerFi is a hamburger restaurant chain that is focused on a better quality burger. It offers hormone, steroid, and antibiotic-free beef. The first location was opened in February 2011 in Florida. In 2017, the chain partnered with Beyond Meat and introduced a vegetarian vegan burger called the Beyond Burger. The Consumers Union graded the top 25 burger chains in the U.S. on their beef quality. BurgerFi was one of the two chains that were given an A rating. The company has 25 corporate-owned locations and 93 free franchise stores. They are planning on growing both franchised and corporate owned stores this year and into the future. BFI was funded by a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company is formed to raise money through an IPO, then acquire a private business to help them go public. This is also known as a reverse merger or reverse takeover. In December 2020, the merger was completed. The SPAC that acquired BFI was OPES Acquisition Corp. The company is headquartered in North Palm Beach, Florida and was founded in 2011. The ticker trades on the NASDAQ and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a micro cap company, 109 million market cap. They're trading at 513 a share and they have 21 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They do have negative free cash flow each year since they're still growing their revenue. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. Revenue is a sales for the company and that was 45 million in a trailing 12 months up from 33 million in 2020. They recently went public, so we don't have much financial information prior to 2020. This is the company's income statement from their latest quarterly report. This shows us the first nine months of 2020, the first nine months of 2021, the third quarter of 2020, and the third quarter of 2021. So in the third quarter of 2021, they had 8.7 million of restaurant sales from its corporate owned locations. It received 1.9 million of royalties from its franchise locations. They charged franchises a marketing fee that was almost half a million. And when someone opens up a new franchise, they charge an upfront franchise fee. I personally owned a franchise. It was called Mathnasium, tutoring kids in math. I owned that for 10 years. When I bought into the franchise, I paid a $27,500 upfront franchise fee. Now, if you open a Mathnasium, I think it's 50,000. Then every month, I had to give them 10% of my revenue for royalty and 2% of my revenue for marketing fee. McDonald's does not own any stores. It's 100% franchise. This company is doing it a little different. They have a hybrid model where they want to open corporate locations, I think mainly in Florida, and also franchise. There is a risk when you open up a location because you have to staff it, you have to manage it, and of course you may lose money in that location. When you franchise a location, there's minimal risk. Their expenses in the third quarter were 2.7 million for food, beverage, and paper costs, 2.5 million for payroll, 1.9 million of other, and 700,000 for rent. General and administrative expenses were 4 million. These are the payroll for its corporate office, 600,000 of pre opening costs. These are for its corporate owned locations. This would include marketing and other costs to get the store opened. 132,000 of store closure costs. 3.7 million of stock based compensation. This is a good way to subsidize an employee's salary. 2.2 million of depreciation and amortization. Because if it owns any locations, it has to depreciate that asset over its useful life. They have an operating loss of 7.8 million. Their revenue is still low. I imagine once their revenue grows enough, they'll be able to cover their fixed cost and start to make a profit. 
They only spent 5,000 of interest on their debt. In the third quarter of 2020, it was 10,000, and they had a net loss of 5 million. Last year was a net loss of 800,000. This is the company's operating cash flows from their statement of cash flows. This is directly from their 10Q. And this shows us the first nine months of 2020 and the first nine months of 2021. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net loss of 4.2 million, then you add back 6.5 million of depreciation, they pass through a gain of 2.2 million on PPP loan forgiveness. We have to minus that out on a statement of cash flows. We have to add back stock-based compensation. That's a non-cash item. They pass through a gain of 10 million on a fair value warrants. We have to minus that out. And then we have to adjust for changes in working capital. Even though they reported an accounting loss of 4.2 million, they only lost 800,000 of cash flow. Their revenue by the end of 2023 is projected to be 212 million. I'll show you in my model in a little bit. I have their revenue at 2024 around 212 million. So I push it out one year. This is the investing and financing sections on their statement of cash flows. The first nine months of 2020, the first nine months of 2021. And they spent 8.2 million in PP&A. That was pretty much everything in their investing section. In their financing section, they pay down $3 million on a revolving line of credit. That's pretty much everything in their financing section. This is the equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They have $261 million of equity. They raised $270 million from selling their business, and they lost $6.5 million from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. $262 million of equity, $1 million of debt. So they're 100% equity, 0% debt. And I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 7.8%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated three years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year three, that's 467 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $369 million. We divide that by 21 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $17. They're trading at $5, so they're trading at a 70% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. Their revenue is projected to grow 61%. So I grew their revenue 61% up through 2024. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. The average company in their industry converts 11% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their 2024 revenue by 11%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And I assumed they would have negative free cash flow in 22 and 23. I do think there's a good chance the stock will come down to two, three dollars. It seems like most SPACs have really struggled. If the company keeps growing and scaling their business, then it's a great buy. Of course, there's lots of risk involved. It is a really small company. One analyst priced this stock and their price target is $11. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. When it started out as a SPAC, it was $10 a share like every other SPAC. And the deal actually closed in December. But when they announce an acquisition target, that's when a stock price goes up. And sometimes the stock doubles, triples, quadruples. This almost doubled. Then it came down. Surprisingly, it came back up. But ever since mid-March, the stock has pretty much only gone down. A lot of SPACs have come down below $1 a share. There's definitely a chance this stock may get there too. I'm not saying it's a bad company. It's just there's a lot of fear in the market. And you can see by their business model, they provide a healthy burger. They compare their burgers to Five Guys, Shake Shack, Smash Burger, and The Habit, which I've never heard of. They're the only company with plant-based protein. They're also the only company with gourmet sauces. Smash Burger only has one check, craft beer and wine. The Habit only has one check of fresh cut sides. They opened their first location in February 2011. Their first franchise location was in 2012. In 2014, they opened their 50th store. In 2017, they added chicken products. In 2020, they opened their 50th store in Florida. They went public in December 2020. They were recognized as a top fast food casual chain in the U.S. 2021 was their best year. They opened 16 locations. The stock has gone down 66% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 14%. The 52-week low is $5, the high is 17 
and the stock is on a major decline trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. About 100,000 shares are traded each day of the 21 million shares outstanding, 9 million are on float, 22% are held by institutions and over 4% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company when it started trading, you'll be at $5,300 today. There's been a good amount of insider selling the past 12 months. Only 50,000 insider shares have been purchased, 15,000 shares have been sold, and 1.2 million have been sold. John Rosati, the founder of the company, has been doing a lot of selling. An executive at the company bought 50,000 shares last month. The general public owns 32% of the company, 30% by insiders, 16% by private companies, 13% by hedge funds, and 10% by institutions. The founder owns 18% of the company, then Cardboard Box, Lion Point Capital, Ofer Sternberg, another insider of the company, and Andrea Acker. Ofer is the founder and CEO of Lion Point Capital. Ofer is the executive chairman of the company. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. They do have a good price to sales ratio of 2.4, that stock price over sales per share. As the market cap comes down for the company, it makes these ratios look better because price to sales is market cap over revenue. And price to book is really good at 0.4, that stock price over book value per share. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on a balance sheet, it's assets minus liabilities. And they have 262 million of equity, 27 million of tangible equity. Let's look at their non-current assets, 15 million of property and equipment, 124 million of goodwill. Goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company, 111 million of intangible assets, this may include patents or trademarks, for example, and 240,000 of other. Since they recently went public, they have a good amount of cash on their balance sheet. Their current ratio is 3.0, that's current assets over current liabilities. Let's look at their current assets, 28 million of cash, half a million of receivables. This is how much money other companies owe Burgify, 400,000 of inventory, 700,000 of assets held for sale, and 1.5 million of other. Let's look at their current liabilities, 2.4 million of accounts payable. This is how much money Burgify owes other companies, 2.3 million of accrued expenses, these are expenses the company has incurred but it hasn't paid yet. 4.1 million of other, $900,000 of franchisee deposits, 600,000 deferred revenue, and 76,000 notes payable. Deferred revenue is when someone prepays for a product in advance and then when Burgify delivers the product to the customer, they'll remove the dollar amount off of their liability section and book it as revenue onto the income statement. They had negative 12 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and they have 21 million of working capital. So it looks like they may be able to get through the next 12 months without taking on any more debt or adding more equity. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 53 companies in the same industry as Burgify. And Burgify ranks 44th in market cap at 109 million. The average is 8 billion. McDonald's is the largest by far. They do have a good price to sales ratio. It is average. But all the other numbers are pretty weak since they're such a small company. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 70% discount. But this is a really risky stock to invest in. If you want to put a little money into it just to test it out, that's fine but you may lose most of your investment. Even if the company is really successful, it could take five or 10 years for the stock price to get to a decent level. I ranked their free cash flow as one out of 10, their revenue three out of 10, and their ratio is three out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.